Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Henrik Palmgren. and thank you for tuning in today. I hope you had a good week so far, and we'll be enjoying a weekend coming up here. We are working hard on some exciting additions to RedEyesCreations.com and some major updates to the website as well, so definitely stay tuned for that. If you like what we do, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to the RSS feeds. And by the way, you can also hear the first hour of our program on SoundCloud. We are also on TuneIn and Stitcher. We have uh, links from RedEyesCreations.com. When you want to hear the full show, RedEyesMembers.com is the website where you can sign up and tune in to all programs going back to 2006. We're coming up on 10 years here soon. We have uh, over a thousand shows. We have videos, inside episodes, films, and much more. Our guest today is Benton L. Bradbury, or Ben Bradbury, author of The Myth of German Villainy. He served in the U.S. Navy from 1955 to 1977, from near the beginning of the Cold War to near its end. His generation was inundated with anti-German propaganda and Holocaust lore. In his role as a naval officer and pilot, he was also immersed in the anti-communist propaganda and the war psychosis of the Cold War, which seemed very much like the anti-German propaganda. He has had a lifelong fascination with the history of this period, and has read deeply into all aspects of it. He also saw much of Europe during his Navy years and traveled widely in Europe since. A natural skeptic, he long ago began to doubt that the propaganda told the whole story. He spent years researching the other side of the story and has now written a book about it. Benton is a graduate of the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, with a degree in political science and international relations. This is a uh, fascinating show here. Probably goes against most of what you've been told. So this will be a lot of fun. Hi, Benton. Very good to have you with us today. Thank you so much for coming on. Hope you're doing well today. You're doing very well. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I've uh, actually known about your work for some time, and I'm really glad that we managed to get you on the, the show finally. I have a copy of The Myth of German Villainy in front of me here, and I've been going through some more uh, details of the book today. And uh, it's just... It's just a fascinating read. I mean, it, it it contains all those things that we are not supposed to know about. And perhaps more importantly, no, it goes through the background and certain kind of uh, reasoning, really, historically and geopolitically, that you don't get in other works that just strictly focus on uh, revisionism, perhaps, or, or just looking at World War II, etc. Tell us a little bit about why you wanted to write the book. Yeah, I, I've had an interest in this uh, era, this period between all of the 20th century, say, of uh, European wars and the period in between all my life. And all my life, I've been a serial reader, uh, one book after another. I even today read about uh, one to three books a month. And so I would, had taken an interest in this uh, World War I and World War II. And uh, I was uh, born in 1937, uh, before the war, and lived through the war, and, and my generation was inundated with uh, anti-German uh, hate propaganda. We were taught literally to hate the Germans as a people. The German nation was characterized as probably the most evil nation in history. The German people were an evil race, and Hitler was the uh, uh, epitome of the devil. That was what we were brought up to believe. And later on, uh, we uh, were inundated with anti-communist, uh, anti-Russian propaganda that sounded very similar to me. But um, as I said, I've, I read a lot, and I began to read books many, many years ago, of the, of the other side of the story written by German people, German enlisted men in the uh, army, German officers and so forth. And um, you start to think, well, there's another side to the story. And the more I dug into it, I indeed found that the official story, like Napoleon says, history is a lie agreed upon. The official story of that era is uh, baloney. It's uh, nowhere near uh, represents what actually happened. And so I started to dig and probe and find out what actually did happen. Happen, And so uh, what emerged uh, in my mind after reading for many, many years, even I even went out to Eastern Europe and looked into the, some of the concentration camps and uh, found that the real story is almost the opposite of what we grew up to believe. And that's why I decided to write the story. I'm not a historian. I uh, am not a professional writer. 
I just have an interest in the subject, and it just seemed to me that the other side needed to be told. Well, it certainly does. Now, you've been serving in the military and, of course, as a consequence, traveled all over the world, seen a lot of uh, places in Europe and, of course, in Germany, too. And in the beginning of the book, you talk a little bit about that in terms of how much you also appreciate uh, the German people and the, and the German character. So how, what was that like if you've been told one thing all your life and then you're kind of starting to discover another thing for yourself when you're actually there? I went to Germany first in 1989 on my way out to Eastern Europe to go to Auschwitz and to look at Eastern Europe in general because I'd been reading so much about the events that occurred out there. And I stayed with an old couple uh, in their house in Frankfurt. I spent uh, a night with them and they put me up and I thought, what wonderful people they were. Everybody I saw in Germany was not that different from people that I grew up with. Uh, and I thought I'd been influenced myself by reading all this stuff, that Germans were somehow different, militaristic, uh, uh, brutal, uh, uh, inclined to follow uh, dictatorial leaders and this kind of stuff. And I've been to Germany a few times now and taken tours of the country. And the German people are just the opposite of that. They're highly civilized, highly cultivated the very heart and soul of the Western Christian civilization. And it would take, uh, uh, it's impossible to believe the things that were written uh, about what the atrocities and so forth that the Germans were supposed to, supposedly uh, responsible for. And so they, I, I just changed my mind completely about them. Oh, certainly. Now we'll uh, talk more about the uh, background to the story a little bit later here, but I wanted to ask you about the image, I guess, that has been projected upon us, the, the, the official version or whatnot, what, uh, if you can give us kind of a caricature, if you will, what are we supposed to think about the German people? If we, if we take into consideration um, all the movies, the, the TV shows, the books and, and mainstream line media outlets, what kind of image are they portraying in your view? Well, as I discuss in my book, uh, Germany... Well, first of all, Germany was a kind of a geographical expression before uh, Germany became a consolidated uh, state in 1871 under Prince Otto von Bismarck. They pulled all the little principalities and in, in uh, private estates and monarchies and so forth. There were numerous of them, and he consolidated them into one uh, consolidated German nation state in which... Uh, had a population of about 65 million people, which made it the most powerful state in Europe uh, almost instantly. But uh, but and and then World War One began. We'll discuss that later. But before World War One, Germany had a reputation which was just the polar opposite of what they acquired after the propaganda, war propaganda, and so forth began in World War One. They were considered to be a highly civilized people. Uh, they were inclined to uh, music and philosophy and, uh, and so on. They produced some of the world's greatest music, Beethoven, Mozart, we can name a whole list of them, the uh, scientists, uh, philosophers, everything. That was what Germany's reputation was up until World War I began. And because uh, uh, Britain wanted to win the public opinion of their people over to support the war, and they also wanted to drag the United States into the war on their side. They began this hate propaganda program against the Germans, which portrayed them as vile beasts who knuckle-dragging Huns, who liked nothing better than to flip babies into the air and catch them on their bayonets and to rape young Belgian girls and so forth. And... Uh, this was just the opposite of their reputation up to that point. Yeah, tell us a bit about that. Let's let's go into that. I mean, you write on the, on the front cover of your book, we can read, neither Kaiser Wilhelm nor Adolf Hitler wanted war. Both World War I and World War II were thrust upon German, Germany by the Allied powers. Germany's great sin was emerging too late as a consolidated nation-state and upsetting the long-established balance of power scheme in Europe, the already established great powers, Britain, France, and Russia, joined together in 1914 to destroy this new rival. Uh, tell us a bit about what kind of, I mean, it's a, it's a fairly young young nation at that point, right? We, we're not, of course, in Weimar Republic yet. That's after 
you know, World War One. But how, how did Germany kind of come together uh, before World War One? Yeah, as I said, Germany was kind of a geographical uh, expression of Central Europe was populated by German speaking, blonde haired ethnic Germans, but there were just a multiplicity of little sovereign entities, principalities, uh, estates, and so forth. And um, Prussia went to war with, with France, actually, the Franco Prussian War. France declared war on Prussia, and Prussia won the war. And uh, as a consequence, uh, France was required to, to pay reparations, and they took, and, and Prussia took the two provinces, French provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, and made them part of Germany. And then he pulled all the German states together and consolidated it in the modern uh, state of Germany. Now, uh, Prince uh, Metternich, back in the Congress of Vienna in 1815, after the Napoleonic Wars, had worked out this balance of power scheme for Europe to keep the peace. And all the powers in Europe recognized each other, each great power, and they recognized the spheres of influence of each of these powers. And then come along Germany, which had not existed uh, as a nation state before, and they emerged in 1871 as this superpower of 65 million people, bigger than any other European except for Russia, uh, and uh, immediately they are a power to be reckoned with. And um, Great Britain had grown accustomed to being the superpower of the world at that point. It had been so for a century and a half. They had dealt with France already and, and, and they put France in their place. And Britain was uh, accustomed to being the superpower, and they were never going to permit an accumulation of power on the continent of Europe, which would uh, rival their own power. And suddenly here was Germany, which began to grow exponentially after the consolidation in 1871. They began to uh, outdistance everybody else in manufacturing and technology and science, uh, chemistry, uh, pharmaceuticals, everything. And this caused uh, consternation in Great Britain, and the leaders of Great Britain began to talk about having a war with Germany, to put Germany in, in her place. Now, the Germans didn't want war. They were succeeding fantastically, and they wanted anything but a war. They were creating an empire of their own down in Africa that was uh, emulating those uh, other European empires. They were building a navy to facilitate the empire. And uh, they were taking over markets that had been British markets for a long time. And so this was uh, 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 kind of unsettled or destabilized the old balance of power. And that's where we were in, say, 1914. That's very uh, interesting what's happening at this uh, time. I, w I wonder, wanted to mention something about, there was a book that came out, I think it was first 19, yeah, originally published in 1944. Uh, by a gentleman called E.C. Knuth, and he wrote about the uh, the secret history of British financial power. The book was called The Empire of the City. But one thing that he details in there is just what you mentioned, that term, balance of power, that England, interestingly enough, joined with anybody they could uh, in these years here uh, prior to World War One, just to basically knock down whatever peg managed to rise above the rest, right? So they could join Russia one year to fight France, and then two years later, they joined France to to fight Russia or, or Germany or, you know, supplant these with anybody. So it seems to be uh, the book tries to give you this, gives you the impression that yeah. England did whatever they needed to do and join whoever they wanted to join with to make sure that they were in the seat of power. What would you say to that? Yeah, they joined France in the uh, war against the Crimean War against Russia for that very reason, to bring Russia down. And uh, so they were ready to uh, act against any accumulation of power which uh, threatened or rivaled their own. And so when Germany emerged, uh, the British, as I said, became very nervous. But also the, the French were, uh, had their own reasons to want to uh, go to war against Germany. They had lost, they, they declared war. I mean, France, did I say France? France was accustomed to lording it over the continent, not being defeated by some upstart like uh, Prussia, and their pride was uh, was severely damaged by losing the Franco-Prussian War. 
And all they talked about in the military academies of France after the Franco-Prussian War was was vengeance and, and getting even and restoring their pride. And then also recovering their two provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, which the Germans had taken from France. Now, they had a, a cause to take those provinces because they had been taken from Germany by Louis XIV a few decades prior, and the population of Alsace and Lorraine was about 65% uh, ethnic uh, German-speaking Germans. So there was, uh, they, they weren't without cause to take those two colonies. Okay, now, so you've got, uh, and I'm talking about what what led to the World War One, and it wasn't uh, Germany that started it. Also, the Russians had their own problems with Germany. The Russians were kind of bottled up in the Black Sea, and what they wanted for economic uh, survival and, and, and growth was to have an outlet into the Mediterranean Sea with, through the Bosporus Straits there where Istanbul is. Now, Istanbul belonged to um, it was part of, it's Turkey and belonged to the Ottoman Empire, and Ottoman Empire at that time, before World War I, was, uh, had an alliance with Germany, and Germany had a fleet in Istanbul, which kind of bottled up the Russians in the Black Sea, and the Russians wanted to, the only way they saw to, to obtain control of this area was to go to war with Germany. So you had Britain, uh, who had their reasons to want to go to war with Germany, you had France, had their reasons, and you had Russia, and they had their reasons, all had just something to gain by going to war with Germany. Germany, on the other hand, had nothing to gain by a war and every reason to stay out of a war and indeed did not want a war. So this uh, was bubbling and boiling with Germany trying to uh, avoid a war with the, the Allies, those three powers, uh, intent on having a war. So all you had to have was a, uh, a pretext, a casus belli, I suppose, and that was provided. When the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the Austrian Archduke, and his wife Sophia went down to Bosnia on a state visit, and he was murdered down there by a revolutionary Bosnian who didn't like that Bosnia was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and they were murdered in their car by this guy named Princep Gavrili, and uh, this incensed the Austrians. They had to get revenge for this. And so they were determined to attack, invade Bosnia. But they were a little bit ambivalent about it. And the Germans uh, uh, gave them a blank check, so-called. And the reason they gave them this blank check, they said, we'll back you up if you go to war against the Bosnia. And the reason they gave them this blank check is because Russia was the superpower over in the east, and they were the protectors of their little Slavic brothers, they called them, that is the Balkan states, and they were ready to go to war to, against Austria, Austria-Hungary, uh, uh, to defend Bosnia. So that's kind of where things were. And um, so what was the actual cause of the war? The actual cause of the war, well, the trigger, which set things rolling, was the murder of the Archduke and his wife. Yep. Yep. But then... Russia mobilized their forces. Now, mobilization back in those days was considered an act of war. And Germany, uh, the reason is because it took some time to mobilize and get your forces ready for war. And uh, another power couldn't sit idly by and wait to see what you were going to do. And so once one country mobilizes, another is almost obligated to do it. So Germany then mobilized, and they, they were technically at war with each other, and then France mobilized, and so they were at war with each other. And so that was really the Russian mobilization is what started the war. Can you tell us a bit about Gavril Princip? Uh, I know that he was part of something called the Black Hand, and or it's also been called a unification or death, I believe. Do you think that there was some kind of conspiracy or, or, or foul play here to initiate this whole thing? I don't know a whole lot about that. I've read about it, forgotten a lot about it, but uh, he was part of, a, I understand, part of an organization that was supported by the Bosnian army, by the military people. And they were 
resentful and, and uh, of uh, the Austro-Hungarian power and wanted their independence. And I think that's what was behind it, was uh, they wanted a revolution against Austria-Hungary. I see. So uh, let's talk a bit about what happens after this point. Then. So obviously what you described is that there is centralization of power at this time. Germany emerges as a uh, as a powerhouse, really, as as be- because of that. It's industrialization. You have uh, the Berlin Conference around in that time as well. How, do, how does all this come together and how does the other powers begin to kind of uh, formulate propaganda and whatnot against Germany at this point? Okay, once, once Russia mobilized, Germany was obligated to do it and France had already agreed with Russia that they would do it, they'd mobilize. And so here's Britain sitting out here wanting to jump into it for her own reasons. They want to knock Germany down as a great power. All they needed was a pretext. Now, Germany is sitting there on a plane, a flat plane in the middle of Europe with no natural boundaries or or protections at all. And the one thing they worried about more than anything else was having a two-front war uh, to fight France on one side and Russia on the other. So they devised this, what they called the Schlieffen Plan, after Field Marshal von Schlieffen, and this called for, this was defensive more than offensive. And Germany is uh, tagged with being, uh, you know, invading uh, Belgium and therefore uh, as an offensive move, but it was really defensive in nature, the, uh, the sleeping plan. Called for rapid mobilization of the German army, so sweep through Belgium into France, knock France out of the war with a blitzkrieg, wheel around and then take on the Russians. That's the Schlieffen plan. So that's what they did. But the Belgians offered resistance un- unexpectedly, and it bogged the German forces down. And uh, there was a, a, evidently some atrocities uh, on both sides, but the British used that as a pretext to come into the war. All they needed, they were ready to go. All they needed was a pretext. And so they came and uh, brought their army into France. Now, because they were slowed down in Belgium, the French weren't able to go right into the heart of France, to Paris, and knock France out. They got bogged down in trench warfare. And so that changed everything. But now they had the war with Russia on the other side, so they had to uh, organize an army to go in and face the Russians, which they did. And they left a limited number of forces, of of ground troops, in the trenches in, in France. And so... The French war on the Western Front bogged down into a stalemate, which lasted through the rest of the war, actually. And then the Germans went in and took on the Russians and defeated the Russians. And uh, even in the end, uh, made a peace with them, the Brest-Litovsk peace treaty with the Russians, which ended the, the war. So here they are bogged down into war. But, I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh the Germans were doing very well in the war. And in, 19, in the summer of 1916, it appeared that they were going to win the war. It looked like they would win. They had uh, destroyed the British uh, merchant navy with their submarines and were starving the British. And um, they made a proposal for a peace to stop the war, the Germans did because they, were, they didn't want the war to start with, and now it looked as though they were about to win, and they made a peace offer, which Britain rejected out of hand. Right. Yeah. And uh, so the, the war, war continues, and the only way Britain could win, and they were working mightily at it, was to bring the United States in on the Allied side. And they were working, uh, attempting that. They were, had a hate campaign, propaganda campaign against the Germans going on in the United States at the time with all these atrocity stories about cutting off uh, Belgian boys' hands, gang raping g- Belgian girls, uh, throwing babies in the air and spearing all this stuff. All, the, uh, all of which turned out to be nonsense and was refuted after the war. But nevertheless, the attempt was to change American public opinion and get America into the war. A couple of months later, I think in November of 1916, this was uh, where the Jews come in. I I told you that the sub-theme of the book was the role that the Jews had played in the events of the 20th century. And here enters the Jews. 
a guy named Heim Weitzman, who's a big guy and in, in leader in international Jewry. He became the first prime minister of uh, the state of Israel, by the way. He and a group of other international Jews went to the leaders of Britain and told them that we are very influential in America. The Jews surround Wilson and are very influential with him. If uh, The Zionists at that time wanted uh, Palestine to be given to Jews so that they would have a home country of their own. That was what, that was an objective of the Zionists. Mm-hmm. So these Jews went into the British leaders and said, we will do our best to bring America in, we think we can do it, into this war, if you will promise that Palestine is ours when the war is over. So the British said yes. So these international Jews got busy with uh, the Jews in uh, America, the ones that surrounded uh, uh, Wilson, and they are the ones that were responsible, really, for making him president. They funded him. They uh, backed him up with, uh, you know, newspaper stories and so forth. And uh, so these um, Weitzman and his group got to work with on the uh, American Jews, and the American Jews got to work on Wilson. And I'll, I'll give you the names of some of these guys. Uh, they were these Jews in America that surrounded Wilson. They were very powerful men, very wealthy. Jacob Schiff, who was the head of the Kuhn Loeb Bank, the biggest bank in America at the time. Mm-hmm. Paul Warburg, a big banker. Uh, Henry Morgenthau Sr. Louis Brandeis, who was the first Supreme Court Justice, a Jewish Supreme Court Justice, that is. Bernard Baruch, a very powerful, uh, wealthy man. Uh, Rabbi Stephen Wise, and then there was uh, Felix Frank Fitter, Footer, were just a, a group, a handful of the group that surrounded Wilson. Well, they got to work on Wilson. Now, Wilson was already predisposed to go to the aid of the mother country that is Great Britain. He was at the old uh, East Coast school where they, we saw ourselves as uh, saw England as our mother country and so forth. So the American people were very against an involvement in any war. So uh, they got to busy with the propaganda campaign. The Americans now joined the British effort, uh, and the Jews specifically mounted a, an anti-German campaign. They brought about pretexts like the sinking of the Lusitania, the Zimmerman telegram, all these things. Were, and finally, within six months after these uh, powerful Jews went to the British, offering to bring the Americans in. Within six months, America declared war on Germany. Hmm. And uh, America was in the war, and of course that spelled the end of the war because Germany and the Central Powers could not withstand this combination of forces. So let's talk a bit about what happens at this time in some of the other parts in the world. It's a very complex image, um, frankly, but I think you, you know, you've done a really good job in churning all these things out. Uh, in terms of the chronology of what happens and what hap- you know, where it happens. Uh, but so obviously, even before World War I has ended, really, you have uh, 1917, the, the revolution in, in Russia, the rise of Bolshevism over there. Uh, you have, at the same time, as you said, an interest, of course, in the, uh, the Zionist movement that, are, that is seeking to uh, get a homeland in Palestine and all these kinds of things. Um, let's, let's talk about that later, but let's talk about what's happening in Russia here that I actually don't know when they, um, are, are not participating in the war at that point again, but it, obviously, as I said, the war hadn't even finished and already they have a revolution over in Russia. Tell us about that a bit and, and the red terror and, and what kind of instigated all of this. Yeah. Okay. The Russian economy was in bad shape at at the end of the war, and there was revolution in the air. The people were rebelling, wanted to get out of the war and so forth, to the point that the czar finally had to abdicate, and he was eventually taken prisoner, and his family were put up in a house out in uh, in the Ural Mountains in a little town called the Ekaterinburg, and they were guarded out there. But that that came a little bit later. But... um, uh, what happened is is the, the Jews uh, had invented communism, by the way. Communism is a Jewish movement. Uh, I just well say that right up front. And the Jews had been fomenting revolution in Russia for a long time. They had attempted to depose the Tsar in 1905 with a revolution which failed. 
And this was funded, this revolution, this 1905 revolution, was funded by international Jewish banks, but it failed. And uh, measures were taken against these people by the Tsar and so forth. But anyway, it, uh, high on the agenda, agenda of the international Jewry was to bring down the Tsar and bring down the Russian government. And because of the uh, uh, destabilization of, of the economy and so forth, because by the war, uh, they were able to do that in 1917. And they had a provisional government set up uh, after the Tsar had abdicated. And a guy named Kerensky came in as head of the government. He was Jewish, significantly. He was Jewish, but he was not a Bolshevik or a communist, but he was a far left liberal. And he wanted to set up a, a socialistic kind of a government, but he wanted to do it slowly. But one of the first things he did, significantly, was that he uh, erased all bans on, on Jews in Russia. And he let all the Jews out of prisons, the revolutionaries, and, and, and let any Jew who wanted to come back into Russia come back in. And they flooded in. They flooded in, and they flooded into the government and took jobs in the government. And he also outlawed anti-Semitism and even imposed the death penalty for anti-Semitism. So that's what Kerensky did. Hmm. Now, in the meantime, Lenin, who was one-fourth Jew, by the way, and Trotsky, who was 100% uh, Jew, Trotsky lived in New York City at the time, and Lenin, I think he was in Switzerland, yes, he was, and the Germans, because these were uh, recognized revolutionaries, communist revolutionaries, Lenin was uh, paid by the German government and put on a SEAL train, he and about 80 other, mostly Jews, and sent into St. Petersburg to go in, and they were funded by the German government uh, for the purpose of destabilizing the, the Russian government and taking them out of the war. That was the reason they did that. Now, here comes Trotsky at the same time, a few days later, from New York City, funded by Jacob Schiff, the Jewish uh, head of the uh, Kuhn Loeb Bank. Uh, and he's funded with about three or 400 uh, Jews from the Lower East Side of New York City, and they're given American passports. Louis Brandeis on the Supreme Court uh, pressured President Wilson to have them given pass, American passports to facilitate their coming into uh, Russia. And they came, uh, got there at about the same time, Lenin and Trotsky, and they combined forces and they began uh, the Bolshevik Revolution. They overthrew Kerensky, took over the government. And uh, this was amounted to a Jewish coup d'etat of the Russian state. This isn't, you, don't, you won't read this in history books. No. And uh, but this that's what it amounted to. And there's a guy named Robert Wilton. I, I put this in my book. He had a, he wrote a book at that time, uh, at the time of that rev of the revolution. Now, he was a journalist from London who had been in Russia and the capitals and reporting back to London on developments there. And he was an expert on what was happening. And he found a list of the 556 top leaders of the Bolshevik government and with their ethnicity and he put it as an addendum in the back of his book i have his book and i copied it and pasted it and put it in my book of the 556 top bolsheviks in the in the bolshevik government 447 of them were jews incredible mm -hmm. and i've put the names of each one of them and what their ethnicity is and even those who were not Jews, the hundred or so that were not Jews, almost none of them were Russians. Just to, uh, just a few were Russians. They were Poles, uh, uh, Georgians, uh, Latvians, uh, and so on. And a high percentage of them had Jewish wives. So this was a Jewish coup d'état of the German of the Russian government. The Jews had taken it over, and. Uh, they met some resistance, of course, and they organized an organization called the Cheka, C-H-E-K-A. It's an acronym for something. I can't remember exactly what. But it's kind of their secret, not really secret police, a terrorist police. And they uh, organized this terrorist police, something like 200,000 of them before they finished. It was a large organization. And significantly, 75% of the agents of this Cheka were Jewish. And again, of the 25% who were not Jews, 
a high percentage of them had Jewish wives. So this was another Jewish organization. Uh, they launched a red terror against the Russian people, against Russian Christians. The Jews hated the Russians, and the Russians hated them in return. And now the Jews controlled Russia, and they were lording it over them as an alien force that had taken control of the Russian state and the Russian people. And they had all the power, since they controlled the government, they had all the power of the government, the military, everything in their hands. Yeah, one of the biggest mass murders in uh, human history. For, uh, some, some say as many as 40 million Russian Christians died at the hands of the uh, Reds. Yep. And, uh, okay, so where did, where, where did we go from here? They organized, uh, here is a Lenin uh, with Trotsky as his right-hand man. And, and they want to extend this revolution, now that they've got control of Russia, they want to extend this Bolshevik revolution throughout Europe. So they organize the Communist International, called the Comintern, for that purpose. Now, what was the Communist International? The Comintern. It was an organization spread throughout Europe, a communist organization, where they organized communist parties in each European country. Working through, now it's important, uh, you won't read this anywhere, and this has been covered up actually, but communism and Judaism, I've learned, is one and the same thing. Now this common turn, working through the communist parties in all these European countries, worked also through the Jewish communities in each one of these uh, European countries. These Jewish communities served as a fifth column, or a Trojan horse, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Uh, ready and willing to cooperate with the common turn to undermine the existing regimes in Europe and to bring them down and replace them with Soviet socialist republics run by Jews. That was their aim. And they set about uh, taking revolution into Europe after the war was over. And they succeeded. First, their uh, first success, only once did they succeed. They went into Hungary first, right after the war, immediately after the war. Hungary had, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had fallen apart. It was a huge empire, and it had fallen apart al along uh, ethnic lines, and there was the state of Hungary left over uh, as a small state now. But a guy named Bela Kuhn was a Hungarian soldier in the Hungarian army, and had been taken prisoner by the Russians in the war. And when the Russians, uh, at the end of the war, now the, the Red Army's organized, I'm sorry, by Trotsky, and it's run by Jews. And they learned that Bela Kuhn was Jewish, so they took him in, in, into a training program uh, to train him to go back into Hungary to be a, a revolutionary agent, Bolshevik agent. And he organized a group of uh, other all Jewish, incidentally, this, uh, uh, I hate to sound anti-Semitic, but it needs to be emphasized that this was, that they were Jews. It was a Jewish program. Well, I mean, if, if there were any other ethnicity, we would point out that too. It's just a, it's just a fact. Yeah. I mean, it's, the, the reasoning here, of course, is that it's a very tight knit, tight knit group. I mean, if, if, um, imagine if something like this was going on in, in our day and age and all of them happen to be you know, uh, Arabs that were joined by the Islamic faith or something like that, we would point that out equally. It's not a, yes. you know, <laughs> it's not a big surprise that you, that you need to look at this. But yeah, go ahead. So anyway, they took over the, the uh, Hungarian government and immediately launched a red terror against the Hungarian people. They went out, uh, no, I, I forgot to mention that the red terror in Russia set about to kill whole classes of people. And one of the things they went after was the, was the Christian church. They burned down thousands of churches, rounded up priests and nuns by the thousands and killed them in Russia. Now the, in Hungary, that they've taken over the state of Hungary and they're doing the same thing in Hungary, burning down churches and killing priests and nuns. And uh, they've uh, rather clumsily followed the examples that were tried in, in Russia to uh, uh, 
collectivize agriculture in, in uh, Hungary. They took all the farms and made the farmers then work as employees of the collective farms and so forth. They took over, the, they nationalized all industry and all property and so forth. They only lasted about five months, but they created holy hell in Hungary. Terror, red terror was, was an apt name for it. Now, a guy named Miklos Horthy had been an admiral in the uh, Hungarian Navy, and he organized a white army to oppose the Red Army. And he went into uh, Hungary, and along, he managed to get the Romanian army to come in with him, and they went in and drove these Bolsheviks and Belakun out, these Jews out of Hungary, and took control of the government again. Bela Kuhn escaped to Moscow and so on. But anyway, they took over the government again. And because of what they had done to the people of Hungary, there was an intense feeling of anti-Semitism as a result of uh, this experience. Mm -hmm. So, uh, all right, now, following that, they went into Germany, uh, tried to take the revolutions into Germany. All what year? What year was the nineteen nineteen? Uh, I'm sorry, nineteen nineteen. The war ended. The war ended in November. Okay, so so basically, we're we're right in the vicinity of uh, of the Versailles Treaty, right? Uh, how blame was pinned on Germany after you know? So well, we can get into that after. Let's finish uh, what you wanted to say there. Yeah, this is all going on concurrently. Yeah, the, the Versailles Treaty while these revolutions are going on in Germany, but these revolutions are all Jewish led. Uh, we had a, the, in Bavaria, Bavaria became the uh, Soviet so Socialist Republic of Bavaria. And the, what was the Jew's name? Uh, Schott and another guy named Levine. Uh, but it was all Jewish led. And, and then in Berlin, the Spartacus uh, Revolution, Bolshevik Revolution, led by Rosen, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, uh, Jews. Mm -hmm. All these revolutions that sprung up were Jewish-led, uh, working in cooperation with the Comintern, funded by the Comintern, actually, out of Russia to bring communist revolution in Russia. It sprang up all over Europe. And okay, uh, so Nicholas Horthy, Nicholas Horthy put down the revolution in Hungary and saved Hungary from the uh, Jewish Bolsheviks. Now, the Freikorps, in Germany, when, now they, when the war ended, they brought the army back and demobilized it, but they had large units of these soldiers who weren't working for the government, but they were still in uniform, and they organized themselves to resist, resist these communist invasions, or uh, revolutions, I'm sorry. And they succeeded in every case. The communist Jewish-led revolutions were not able to succeed in, in Germany. Now, but they tried it in Italy, and Mussolini came along and saved Italy from the communist revolutionaries. They tried it in Spain, the Spanish Civil War, we all know so much about. Uh, uh, General Franco came in and saved Spain from uh, a takeover by the uh, Bolshevik revolutionaries. Yep. Okay, so that takes us up to about World War uh, Two. But, so, yeah, but yeah, we need to back yeah, back, yeah, and talk about the Versailles Treaty. Right, right, exactly. Let's back up there a little bit. There's so many interesting things that's happening at this time, and it just it's so uh, such a tumultuous period in in Germany. But obviously, um, as you said, the, the Versailles Treaty, even the Balfour Declaration, you have things that really sets the stage for what is coming with the rise of of National Socialism and, and Adolf Hitler. So yeah, let's let's get into that. The Versailles Treaty. Okay. The uh, the Germans, an armistice was proposed, uh, and the, the Germans signed on in November the 11th, 1918, to be precise. And what does armistice mean? Armistice means we'll stop fighting until we can work out a, a peace agreement. But that's not what happened. The uh, Britain and France treated Germany as a defeated uh, enemy. And Germany, the only honorable, the only one that acted honorably in the whole thing, uh, took their army out of the fight and went back and demobilized, but Britain and France did not. Then they met in the Versailles Palace out of the outskirts of Paris to work out a peace agreement in 1919, and they came up with a Versailles Treaty, so-called. Now, they had not 
included the Germans in the discussions, as should have happened, but wrote the treaty and then presented it to the Germans as a diktat. They said, sign here. And in this treaty, they, uh, the Germans were to accept blame for starting the war, which they did not do. And they were to pay horrendous reparations, ruinous reparations, something like a, uh, uh, a tenth, a uh, 13% of Germany's land was taken away and given to in this treaty and given to other countries, along with 10% of their population. Uh, their coal mines were given to other countries. Some of their most fertile farmlands were given to other countries. Their merchant fleet was uh, taken by the Allies and divided amongst themselves. All their trains, thousands of trains, locomotives and so forth were taken. They were stripped bare. They were, their army was uh, uh, reduced uh, by the treaty down to only not more than 100,000 uh, men, which was not enough for anything. Token army. They could have one capital ship, I think it was, or one or two, something like that. But their navy was reduced down to nothing. They, okay, now, what was the purpose of this Versailles Treaty? Britain went into the war to destroy Germany as a great power. That was their motivation. The Versailles Treaty was written to keep Germany down so that they would never be a great power again. And so this virtually enslaved the German people, and the German people were very resentful of it. Now, when they told them to sign, they wouldn't sign. They said, we can't accept this. But now, about a year before the war ended, the British Navy had imposed a starvation blockade on Germany, letting nothing in and nothing out. To, and the result of it was that approximately almost a million Germans died of starvation as a result of this blockade before it was over. Not to mention the millions who had their health ruined by it. But after the war was over, they maintained this blockade for a full seven months and they wouldn't relent until the Germans, they wouldn't let up until the Germans signed this uh, Treaty of Versailles. And finally, they did sign it because thousands of Germans were dying from starvation every day. Yeah, they didn't have much option here. They didn't have an option, but they didn't accept it. They said this, we, we're coerced into signing this, but we don't agree with it. And we don't accept the terms as fair. So tell us what happens. Okay. So... <clears throat> They, uh, the French were the, they wanted revenge. The British were a little more moderate, but the French were determined to have revenge. And they were insisting upon the Germans paying these reparations, which were ruinous. They couldn't, they didn't have the means of paying it. But the French insisted and threatened to in, invade the country if they didn't. So they the result was that the Germans resorted to printing money uh, in order, they, they just printed money and the, 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 the French accepted the printed marks as reparations payments, but they printed so much money that they had a runaway inflation, which soon got out of control, totally out of control. This was in 1923. And uh, it, it, they started printing money, people, they would pay people several times a day because they, the money was worthless. And every day that went by, the money was worth less and less and less. So they, finally, the worst part of it, it took two wheelbarrows full of marks to buy a single loaf of bread. And this just destroyed the German economy, wiped out the savings of all the, uh, these uh, uh, frugal German people, wiped out the middle class. But here's, here's what... Now, who grew rich as a result of the uh, inflation? The Jews were less than 1% of the German population. German population was 65 million, and there were 500,000 Jews living in Germany, less than 1% of the population. Yet these people were controlled banking, controlled finance, and they had access to foreign capital, these uh, Jews did. And so uh, when these people began to, when the, when the inflation ran away with and got out of control, people had to sell all their personal belongings, their furniture, their clothing, uh, everything, uh, just to get enough to feed their children. And they, who did they sell them? They sold them to Jewish-owned pawn shops. 
And these pawnbrokers got rich off of uh, these poor Germans who had to virtually give away their stuff. But the worst part was that uh, Jewish financiers had access to foreign capital. Now, the German money was worth nothing. And so they had access to foreign capital, and they were able to come in and buy up people's homes, people's farms, people's uh, businesses, everything, to the extent that to the point that by the time the inflation ended, uh, Jews, who were less than 1% of the population, owned half of the real estate in Germany. It was the called the biggest transfer of wealth from one group, that is the Germans, to another group, that is the Jews, in German history. And the Germans <laughs> resented it mightily. That was the beginning of, uh, of intense anti-Semitism in Germany. The Jews were exploiting them, as they had done in Hungary. You know, it always comes down to that. It's like, gee, I, w I wonder, I wonder why there was a reaction. Surely, something must have spawned it, right? I mean, it's it's uh, it it makes it makes sense that these are conflicts and issues and uh, struggles that have been going on for a long time before uh, you know National Socialism comes along. Uh, which almost in the history books, it, it makes it seem that this just comes out of nowhere all of a sudden, and then just this deranged hatred for it, but. Let's get into that in more detail in the second segment. We're going to take a break here shortly, Benton. We have so many more interesting things to discuss. I'm really uh, looking forward to really just continuing here. But I wanted to you know, plug the book a little bit. I want to make sure that people know where to go to pick up a copy of this book. It's called The Myth of German Villainy. It's uh, absolutely a fascinating read. It, it consolidates a lot of this history that we are just beginning to scratch the surface of here right now. Um, where can people go to buy a copy of the book? Well, uh, they can go to Amazon on the internet uh, is the is the best place to get it. Just go to go to Google and type in Amazon Books and put in the, the title of the book, and they can order it. Do you, now, do you have a personal website, by the way? Uh, I don't. No. no I need someone set one up the, for you there. I probably, uh, <laughs> I probably should set one up. Yeah, you should. You should. No, there's there's so much to learn from this, and and I know that people are are. Uh, very hungry to learn the truth about this. And, and uh, I think more about this have been coming out in recent years than probably ever before. Of course, thanks to people like yourselves who, who are putting this out there. But yeah, it's just... Well, I, it's, think the, I think the internet has made that possible. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree. So uh, yeah, if anybody out there is listening, is want to want to volunteer some work, maybe there's a way you can uh, uh, get in contact with you, uh, uh, Benton. Is there, do, you, do you have a, a means for people to get a hold of you in some way? I have an email, uh, Ben Bradbury at AOL dot com. B E N B R A D B E R R Y at AOL dot com. Very good. Let's just pause here for a moment and uh, we'll take a short break and then we'll return with the second hour. Much more coming up, folks. So do stay with us. We'll be right back with Benton Bradbury. After the break, we will continue to go through the timeline, the chronology of lies against the German people as we proceed in the second hour with Benton Bradbury. We have a whole lot more to get into and we'll take this into the modern era as well and talk about how this guilt has manifested itself as a collective punishment on all Europeans. If you want to hear the rest, go to redeyesmembers.com and sign up to tune in, stream or download. You can add our RSS feeds in your podcast app or podcatcher and the show will go directly to your mobile device. We have all shows available for download in RSS feeds, broken up in years, by the way, so it's really easy to get the shows that you want. Do take a look in the members archive. You don't have to be a member to browse. We have a lot of shows there for you, so definitely take a look. I'm sure there's something that will pique your interest. By the way, we have our upcoming guests listed in the radio archive. We have uh, Stephen Flowers coming on, talking about the restoration of the Indo-European religion and the connection to Germanic tradition. We have Stefan Jakobsson from the Party of the Swedes. We have Frank Raymond to talk about his book Sweet Dreams and Terror Cells. We also have Uttar Vinis to discuss the Uera Linda book about uh, ancient Frisia or Friesland. Very interesting. We also have Stephen McNallan and some of the European AFA members joining in to discuss how to expand Osatru in Europe. But stay tuned. Much more ahead with Benton Bradbury. We'll be right back after the break. Thank you so much for listening. Do join us in the member section.